Hello, Jesse. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, that's good. Okay. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I have moved. I'm still kind of getting set up in my new place, but uh, the it was a good move. I pretty much moved entirely by myself, which I'm probably never going to do again. <laughs> um, but that's how it goes sometimes, as we know. Yeah. And I was literally sore all over because of, I was going up and down two flights of stuff upstairs each way. Oh, wow. Um, but I'm, I'm happy. Uh, it, it's it's all progress for me, so I'm happy with that. Oh, good. Um, that's like my that's my main update for this week because I haven't done anything else. <laughs> um, but I'm glad to be here. I talked. I had a good conversation with Anson last night too. Um, I mm, hopefully he'll be here. I'm not quite sure. I, I haven't seen him this morning, so I wouldn't be surprised isn't but um hopefully it is and i'm happy to kind of begin talking about things that aren't logistics and moving and how i'm going to sell my old washer and and, and those kind of things so yeah that's, that's yeah. my general yeah. status no yeah, that's good so uh, he's doing okay or yeah i mean you know He's he's still dealing with some things, but um, I we, we had a really interesting conversation about. Uh, I, I wish I wrote down. I wish I wrote down um, the specific words that I used, but we, we centered around you know some of his interests and the sort of allostatic uh, zones of. Like zones of allostasis relative to, like in terms of regulating a lot of different states and how that affects. Uh, it, it, there was a lot of tie into developmental things that we're talking about, and and uh, I kind of mentioned like statistics and statistical mechanics, um, and even there was some conversation led into like I don't know this outside of my range, but like conversation that ran into like. Uh, fluid dynamics, and I mentioned like Brownian motion, and I know like that's all stuff that Norbert Wiener was sort of in certain Severnick way back in the day too. So um, it's all in that area. So um, I know it's not he doesn't have the full capacity to be studying everything right now that he wants to do, but like <clears throat> I think I forget where or how, but I think you might have mentioned statistical mechanics for something a while ago, like in the last month or so, but I don't remember what it was. But um, it, was interesting. it was a good conversation about, about that stuff. And um, I think there's a lot of, I think there's, I think, I think, I think the critical periods and the developmental AI stuff um, has a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things to sort of plug into that and bounce off of that. So I look forward to that in, in the coming months. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. That sounds like a pretty good conversation. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, just, I don't know, maybe offhand, but there's a lot of stuff we haven't really talked about, like actual stat mech in, in this group. But, yeah. this, you know, it's, you know, you can use it metaphorically and you can use it like more mathematically, um, especially with respect to like you know energy landscapes or energy profiles or whatever and people use those widely in machine learning and in deep learning in a lot of those areas so there's definitely like a, a parallel there uh so it's yeah <laughs> yeah i think i think i don't want to i don't i think i think they're they're related to a conversation like Topology, I believe, came up there too, which sort of landscape oriented. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, yeah. 
on There we go. There we go. Yeah, I do see a different background there. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's similar enough for now, but uh, we'll see. I might not. I'm not sure where. I'm not sure where I'm gonna set things up. But this is sort of my new space office. This space, but yes. uh, background may change a few times. But it's definitely a different. As it's nice because it's a little more of a the apartment that I was in before was a very good like it was a great location but it was a very old building yeah. and the, the the water I couldn't really drink the water from the faucet and, and all these like sort of minor level creature comforts were just not there so this is more uh, it's it's a less central location but it's it's much more comfortable in terms of you know, living. And I think that'll help too in the sense of being, I kind of see it as a transition. Like my ultimate goal is still to, first, I wanted to kind of move to Boston or, or California or something by by this year. And this isn't quite that, but I find, I see it's like a stepping stone in that direction. So yeah. <laughs> I'll be applying to a bunch of things, as you know, like grad school wise up ahead, but also like um, there's some jobs that I've been looking at too. So hopefully that'll be I'm excited to have moved, I've done all my stuff, and I can just kind of focus again. So I look forward to that. Good, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, congratulations on that move, uh, getting it done successfully. And yeah. So um, I guess I don't know who else is going to show up, but uh, mm -hmm. we'll just start. <laughs> so welcome to the meeting. Um, if you're watching, I'll be going through uh, a couple of things today. So we had our last week. We talked about our submissions. I, w I walked through those uh, both to Neuromatch and to, to the Neurops workshops that we're we're submitting to. Uh, the Neurops workshops we'll hear back maybe later this month, uh, maybe towards the end of the month. The neuro the Neuromatch submissions I, maybe this next week we're going to hear something back but I, you know th there's going to be apparently some sort of like feedback period that's what they call it um i guess where you get feedback and you have to incorporate it i'm not really sure how that's going to work yet but that's, yeah yeah it, that's not the same as voting that's not just like outright voting i don't think i think it's yeah i think it's different but i don't know yet <laughs> I think they do a lot of things on the fly, so um, you're going to find that. <laughs> maybe they don't do it. Maybe. I guess you have to participate in it, but I haven't gotten any I, I haven't gotten any instructions on it yet, so I don't know. I know I'm, I'm a little bit involved in, in some of the volunteer efforts on, on like the back end, but um, I haven't seen... I have no idea about that. I don't know. I have no idea about the evaluation or feedback uh, uh, version of it. Um, but I know they're doing. I know they're processing a lot of stuff and, and sorting things out. But yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, that's uh, that's going to happen. Um, so Neuromatch is at the end of the month, last week of the month. Oh, hi. How are you? Hey. It's hey. Hi. hey. Uh, we're just getting into the thing about the submissions and the getting talks ready for Neuromatch and all that. So we'll go through that. Um, so yeah, it, so the Neuromatch conference, not this coming week, but the following week. So it's coming up pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we have to talk about, I guess, is uh, presentations. So now that we've got our thing, our abstract submitted and accepted, and people are voting on them and then we're going to have the feedback period then we have to prepare slides for the talks so let me share my screen and so i just wanted to walk through some of the uh presentations that we have already um so i've started the baby minds presentation and so this is some of the 
some of the stuff that's been recycled from other slides. So we have some Breitenberg vehicle introduction. This is like the just a diagram from the A Life conference presentation where we show how the the vehicle develops or adds nodes. Then there's this example of chromotaxis, which is a behavior um, just to walk through it. Then there's this Gibsonian information and there's a set of slides just kind of going through some things that might be, um, you know, important in this. We don't necessarily work out the math here, but we're just kind of introducing the concept and then putting in some stuff on critical periods. Uh, that I was trying to figure out what kind of diagram to use for that, but that's something we can crowdsource. Um, and then some comparisons that from straight from the paper where it's early in light critical period, early developmental freedom, late developmental freedom. And that's a quick overview of, of the different types of contingencies that might exist. And then the final slide, thanks for your attention. So, I mean, this is at 15 slides because I break them up in the way that I do, where you have like different parts of the text highlighted. It can be longer than 15. I think the actual talk is like 12 or 13 minutes. So, you know, we can add it, you know, several more slides, uh, depending on what we want to cover. So, way I'm going to approach this is I'm going to open this up in um, Slack uh, probably tomorrow or tonight. I'll open it up and ask people if they want to go through and propose new slides or different content that we can add to it. And then we'll just uh, edit this collectively and try to get it down to a talk that's about 12 to 13 minutes long um, with, you know, because you have questions at the end and maybe organize it a little bit better although i don't know how you you know i mean basically this is a heading Breitenberg vehicles just to kind of walk through the developmental aspect then i don't even know if we want to put this one in but we might keep it and add to it uh gibsonian information is a heading we just walk through what that is and then critical periods and developmental freedom are well, those are kind of co-headings. And then we walk through what that is. And so that's basically how you go about designing a set of slides for your talk. You pick out the headings, which you want to cover, and then you work out the details. And then you figure out, you know, you keep in mind kind of your slide limit or your time limit. And you say, how many, what, what period of time can I cover with a certain slide? So if it's like, uh, if you think this is going to take, say, like 30 seconds, then if every slide takes 30 seconds, you have 26 <sighs> slides, right? So you just kind of do the math on that. You just think, this, usually people say each slide takes a minute, but that's not always the case because some slides are more involved. Some slides are easy to, you know, if you have a lot of visuals, it might be easier to sort of convey the idea so you don't need to spend a minute on it. And that's how you want to think about putting your slides together is, you know, how much, how long is this slide going to take to present realistically? And then that's your sort of your marker. And then you can like go through your slides, count up the minutes, and then it gives you a rough estimate of what your, how long your talk's going to be. But, I mean, that's the way I approach timing and I'm actually pretty good at timing. Um, but to get it down right to right around the target time is your goal without making, yeah, having to skip over a bunch of slides. I'm sure you've seen people do that in talks. Um, something to generally avoid because it's, uh, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll just skip over these slides and it's like they've got this amazing stuff in there, but you can't see it because I don't have time for it. Yeah. Now I know Jesse and Anson are doing a presentation on um, uh, what's the name of it? The uh, trajectories. Yeah. So with trajectories, it might be a bit different because you have a lot of um, sort of like philosophy, you know, so it's like you're laying out an idea that's not like you can't encapsulate it really quickly, right? 
like this stuff here, if I go back to this, uh, this concept, okay, so like this concept, chromotaxis, I can kind of summarize it in a single slide, right? I mean, you can't really don't get very deeply into it, but it's like right there. I can tell you what the definition is. This slide, Gibsonian information, I mean, I can give you the same thing. I can give you information about it, but it still doesn't give you a lot. You know, there's not a lot of detail. If it's a subtle concept, um, then you might have to put together something like this where you have, like you walk through the steps, you know, you, you break it down to steps of what the components are, and then you walk through them in different slides um, and drawing people's attention to the most relevant thing in the, in the list of points. And then, you know, this part of the slide would be like where we describe this point. So like number three, we describe what number three is over here. And then you move on to the next slide and it's but you have to the timing is a little tricky there because you know you have to kind of get this very big unwieldy idea into a a very small time period so that might require visualizations that might require like really kind of thinking about what's the best way to describe what i'm talking about and so forth so it's it's going to be tricky but i think you know it's it's easy you know it's not it's not easy but you know once you start doing it for a while spending a bit of time on it it becomes a little easier so, uh, so that's the baby minds paper the next one is uh the psychophysics paper so the psychophysics paper is this is with uh basilaria the uh diatom so this is the psychophysics of non-normal cognition I haven't put in any pictures yet. Uh, this is like to introduce, we introduce psychophysics. We have the different models where psychophysics has been conducted. So that, you know, just to give the idea that, you know, it's in humans, but people have also studied mice, people have studied goldfish, and then diatoms. The idea being that people have really applied psychophysics to this group of organisms, but these other organisms have been studied think of goldfish, they look at like color processing. In mice, they look at like auditory stimuli. And in humans, there's a bunch of literature on things, different sensory inputs. Um, so there's a lot of work that's been done, you know, in the literature, we're adding to the literature. And then you give the short introduction of diatoms, because I can assure you that no one at Neuromatch probably knows anything about diatoms, or maybe a little bit at most. So we talk about that maybe for one slide. I don't know where this is going, but this might be something I'll move up here because it's relational psychophysics. So if I find a reference, I'll put it in as an empty slide and then come back to it and then build a slide around that. Um, so then there's the introduction of diatoms. What is a sensory world experienced by diatoms? So this is again, making diatoms relevant to psychophysics. And then here are some like citations of different examples of uh, psychophysics being applied to diatoms that might require a subheading. Again, so we have a heading here, psychophysics and animal models. Another heading here, short introduction of diatoms another heading sensory world then this part with uh the uh, examples and then we get into this idea of collective pattern generators so this is another heading where you describe the thing that you're that you talk about in the the sort of the mechanism in the abstract so this is a collective pattern generator or actually yeah this is a collective pattern generator i didn't put the abbreviation on there. So this is something we propose in the abstract, right? And this mm -hmm. is, uh, so this is just kind of laying out what that is. And you can see that like, you know, you have, so basically what a collective pattern generator in this context is, is you have this uh, sort of this motor 
it's basically like muscle. You have actin filaments and myosin, and they drive movement along a substrate. So this is a cell of a diatom, and this is the cell wall, and the this whole uh, complex, this whole mechanism is along the bottom of one of these cells. And then this is the uh, substratum, which is just, I mean, it could be another cell, it could be a surface, but this is what they move against. And so then this is a very easy way to show, you know, in a very short period of time, this complexity. And so uh, I also want to put a GIF in here of bacillary movement just to show the entire thing moving. And that should give enough context to people. And so uh, then we will build our model around the propulsion, around propulsion as the mode of movement. So this is again, drawing from this slide where we kind of lay out the sensory world and some examples of uh, psychophysics. And then here's a comparison here of, and this might be moved up, uh, a conventional central pattern generator versus a collective pattern generator. Maybe I should move this back, switch this because this is actually the order in which they presented on the slide. So this is a figure that I did here on a collective pattern generator where you have sensory inputs, you have nodes, which are these uh, points where you're saying that the actin and myosin are moving this cell against this cell. And then there are connections between those two you know, motors in terms of how they're synchronized. And that's what these lines are. And this is sort of like a connectionist type thing where we have weights that can be applied. And this is basically the model that we would use where we could say, okay, this is how they're moving. Uh, maybe this motor and this motor are synchronized. These two motors are weakly coupled. These are strongly coupled. And we can uh, state that as a matrix of weights. And then that gives us a model of the movement. This is a central pattern generator by contrast, which is something you find in, in, in uh, insects and in humans even uh, that drive different processes uh, like, you know, moving legs or uh, pumping blood or whatever uh, needs to be done. And so this is the central pattern generator. You have, in this case, neurons with uh, synapses and the synapses um, are either excitatory or inhibitory. And then you have weights on the connections and those mediate the sort of the pattern that's generated, whether it's, you know, tightly coupled to a, a rhythm or weakly coupled to a rhythm or whatever. And so that's, uh, I want to put maybe more animals in here because I always find that when you put animals in a talk, if you're talking about like an animal model, it makes it more relatable to people. Like they understand yeah. that this is in an animal, not just a thing that's out here in the, in a dis disembodied space. So that's, that's that figure, that slide. <clears throat> then kind of walk through potential psychophysical measures, uh, you know, differencing signal to noise ratio, sensory thresholds. That's stuff I, I think we need to work out a bit more with a bit more rigor, but, um, and then you can use a series of coupled sinusoids to model an ideal COPG that might be moved up here before I get into the measures. But basically, uh, we can use coupled um, sine waves to, de you know, to determine like the coupling strength between the two cells and the rate at which they're synchronized in that. You can use this sort of model where you generate these half out of phase, you know, a uh, certain degree out of phase sinusoids that then, you know, you can model them uh, over time. You can also introduce noise into a sinusoid. So that's what this looks like. Uh, it's just basically putting noise in the sinusoid so that there's, uh, you know, so that if you put overlay two, one on top of the other, you know, you get points where they might be synchronized using noise or they might not be, they might uh, lose synchronization because of noise. And so uh, work this slide out a bit more as well. Um, and then the measures, and then that's all I have for right now. So that's, again, something that is uh, going to be opened up 
th like probably this weekend and then we'll just kind of walk through and people can suggest you know the order of slides if they need to be changed or the um maybe slide content if you can think of good slide content and again it's like you know you want to make this visual uh more than just kind of words on a slide um visualizations are you know powerful um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and sometimes you can even prove that <laughs> by uh, doing an information content analysis of the image so it's uh it's always better to have images but to have relevant images um, so you know drawing these animations are actually not that hard in powerpoint um I've been practicing for a while. I found these are very useful. Just drawing like, you know, little shapes and circles and things. But uh, yeah, so that's, those are the two that I, I, I've, I think are most uh, involved the most people in the group and in the Diva Worm group. Now I know that uh, Anson and Jesse have the trajectories presentation. So that's going to be, again, like I said, that's going to be maybe more uh, like sorting of <coughs> sorting ideas out, getting them like outlined, figuring out how they flow, and then describing it in a short period of time. And I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, I would definitely think about putting images in and animations, even if it makes sense. Um, like, I mean, I think, uh, one, of, one of the talks I gave this summer, I did like a roller coaster GIF, which was a demonstration of visual flow. And so that mm. sort of thing, you know, if you think, what's an example of this concept? And then, okay, I can get a GIF and I can put it in the talk and I can kind of work around that. That's the kind of thing you want to aim for. Yeah, um, I'll be working on that this week because I've, I've done nothing this week. I, I think Anson knows too, but like I said earlier, uh, I, I have made, I've, I've done all I've done this week is moving and recover from moving. But next, I think, I think next weekend, so we, we have two weeks until, or is it? Uh, the, the I think it starts the 26th. That's the first day of the conference. And I don't know when they'll need our presentations, but I know they're going to oh, be. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's a whole list for the week. So we have one basically we have one meeting before then yeah right yeah next okay. weekend okay so then maybe i don't know if i'm gonna do i won't do i don't know if i'll do a full draft of things but i'll definitely have the draft uh, a version to present next week yeah so. now yeah, that my now that my midterms are over i should have a little more time too yeah this week was hectic yeah. yeah it's it's always good to have like you know um the like try to set aside some time during the week you know to do like just short periods of time but sometimes it's hard mm -hmm. to work in those time periods but it's you know i just it's scheduling like when you get really busy scheduling is having a scheduling routine is always really good <laughs> and it doesn't seem like it makes sense when you're not as busy but like it yeah, it's something even, it takes practice. Yeah. Even now, it's like I, I'm like I can't find my specific lab notebooks. So I'm like, where's the piece of paper? And it's like, all right, I'll write this here and I'll convert to that later. Like my digital note, like oh, I'm not set up yet. Yeah. So, but like that's that'll be the joy of today. And like I said, I, 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 I sold my washing machine this morning, so that's like the last big thing to deal with. Like, okay, great. Now I can just focus and go back to being a proper nerd and uh, doing this stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I, for, for my, for the cognition one, I think, I think all of these talks were submitted as, um, were submitted as uh, traditional talks. So I think that's like 10 minute, 10 minutes. I think we have like 15 minutes. I think, is that right? We have like 15 minutes total, but like 10 is for the talk and five for discussion, something like that. Yeah. Um, I think all of these are this way. And and for, for my general idea for the one, for the, my trajectory one is, um, 
have some major time, like very timeline oriented, like have some major, you know, timeline things, maybe a little bit of like, you know, a slight nod to some stuff that some trajectories that have been in development for a long time. I actually like really like Fred, Fred Cummins, um, who I also found, I found on YouTube and then on Twitter, uh, Fred Cummins, I think he was talking to actually Shamara or something like that. Uh, he, I really like his, I may, I may incorporate some of his framing of, of things historically. Um, but I have a little bit of, you know, back, backstory and then, you know, a lot of what happened since in the cognitive era of, you know, the fifties and so on until now, where did we go? So I'm kind of my typical thing that I've been saying. And then, you know, the Raphael Nunes paper, the critique, um, and, and, and a lot of the things that have kind of sprung up around that are kind of the general framework. And then along inside that, inside of that, um, I think there'll be a specific, to make it, to, to give, to give, to, to offset the big overview stuff, I think I'm gonna focus on the development of, of embodiment as, as, as uh, you know, Varela's work and building upon that a little bit. So it'll kind of, it, 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 it'll be very, you know, one-on-one level, but that's, I'm very, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to try to do more than that. And honestly, trying to fit that into 10 minutes is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a thing to do. Um, and, and, but, but it will, I'm looking forward to it. It will, it will help crystallize many things to come. So. Uh, that's the general that's the general idea and and I still kind of I still might try to incorporate Ryan and, and, and Daniel some because I mentioned I mentioned I mentioned to our I don't know not sister group, group. Uh, yeah they're, they're they're another study group journal club um, and I mentioned to them and they were interested but I don't I don't think it quite matched up I was gonna try to incorporate them as other authors on it directly but I will definitely at least, at least I'll acknowledge them because a lot of a lot of what I'm drawing from is from those specific conversations that we had too. So, um, but I I wouldn't I wouldn't mind if if there was a specific. Hmm. I'll see what, I'll see if they have something specific they want to contribute still. But but at the very least there'll be the broad overview, specific embodiment, focus, and then the sort of, you know. Where, where we're going kind of thing yeah. so that, that's my uh hand waving uh no slides preview uh for today of that uh, yeah that's all okay is there anything you wanted to add jesse or i mean uh ranson no i'm pretty much on the same page i think it would be a good chance for, for me to overview the evolution of different thoughts and where I fit into those. Yeah, I did. I did also mention at the start. Um, I alluded to some of the conversation that we had uh, yesterday about, like I mentioned, like statistical mechanics, brain motion, and stuff. Not, not in any, in depth. none of any substance, but just like yeah, we've had, we've mentioned those concepts. And, and, and like, I know Bradley mentioned this couple mechanics before and, and, and just kind of like seeing the lines of things that develop there. So, um, that's, that's, that's not related to neuromesh directly. So we can talk about that later, but just to mention that, because I remember now. Yeah. Is there anything we have to do for the neuro IPS stuff? Specifically or? Yet. Yeah, nothing yet. I think that's those that's it's just been submitted and it's going to be reviewed. And I mean, oh yeah, so we have yeah. some review links. Are we should I like publicize those or is that more like don't? I don't, I don't know. Uh, we can wait. I think they're supposed to be anonymized until like they review them. So you know they're just kind of in review, um, and then we'll wait until you know it's accepted or not, and then we'll, you know, like and I, the Baby Minds one, you know, I'm a lot more confident about, but, uh, you know, once that's accepted, I guess it can 
uh, mention that it's, you know, mention more about it. I wouldn't really do much until then. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think it's definitely after we get the decision, we want to start, well, we have to make a presentation for it. So, and that'll draw from the presentation that we do for Neuromatch. So like I said, this is the Neuromatch one is going to be, uh, well, I was thinking it would be more broad, but maybe it should be just kind of like a version of it. <laughs> because I think it's, you know, the I think it's good just to have the sort of the argument, you know, what are the component parts of this approach or whatever we're proposing. And then here, you know, here's how, you know, we, we implement it and, and other things like that. And then it's just kind of, uh, you know, we can get, more specific for baby minds. I don't know what, what our time will be. Maybe we'll have more time during the baby minds workshop to do more slides. So there's that uh, possibility. So then we could just, you know, uh, focus in on some specific things that we had to gloss over in the neuro match talk. Um, or we could introduce some new things that we need to talk about. Um, you know, especially with Gibsonian information, it's like we're that's kind of, we're kind of glossing over what the power of that is in this talk. And so we might talk more about that. I know from the paper, you know, uh, as the paper stands, we have, you know, some pretty good things in there. And then we kind of talk about things in the appendix. So one thing you can do in a conference is when you have a conference paper, is to sort of highlight the things that maybe aren't in the paper. So, you know, mm there are things that we kind of gloss over in the paper we mentioned briefly, but people want to know what that's, you know, maybe there's more to that than what's in the paper because the paper has, you know, formatting limitations. So you can't really get really deep into something uh, in the paper, in the paper, but you can in the presentation. And so, but we'll see what their, our time is. I don't know much time they're going to give us usually 20 to 30 minutes in a workshop because it's a bit they have a bit more time to you know expand upon things as for the shared visual representations workshop i'm not really sure like i mentioned uh, we have there were a lot more submissions to that so we might not get in if we do get in it might be kind of a tight talk so you know that'll be but that'll be something we can work out later I think uh, Europe's is happening in early December, so we have time on that. Okay. Very good. Anything else you want to add, Anson? Nope, that sounds good. Good overview of what's coming up. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I have the, this slideshow out. Uh, this is just, again, the slideshow where we talk about the different submissions. So we have a bunch of submissions outstanding. Uh, Akshara and I are working on this overcompensation of lens accommodation. Oh, are you, is there supposed to be a screen share? Oh yeah, 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 I gotta do this. Yeah, share the screen. So let me go back to this. So we have the submissions here, all submissions. Uh, this again is, the, these are the different submissions. So we have them all sort of listed. Um, and some of these are like, this one is with uh, Krishna. Katya is not in the group here, but you know, we'll be kind of doing presentations for all of these. This is the overcompensational lens accommodation paper. And then mm -hmm. this is uh, Anson and Jesse, tra Trajectories and Cognition Studies. And so we following up on these next week, if people have slides, you can bring the slides. We can walk through, even if you're not done, we can walk through them and kind of get a sense of how long it is. If we need to cut things, if we need to add things, uh, get some, t you know, uh, get some tips on timing for presentation. That's always important to have a model in your head of like, you know, where, how long is a slide gonna take? Where do I start? What do I need to get out of the slide? You know, if I need to move on, if uh, you end up like discussing something a little bit more more detail than you would have liked once you see the slide, you know, can I move on quickly? So those are all things that we can 
discuss next week. And then these are the two uh, NeurIPS uh, presentation or the two NeurIPS submissions. But I think we're, we can wait on that until the end of the, um, until they're accepted at least, probably after NeuroMatch. So I wanted to maybe highlight a couple things here. Um, a couple papers that, oops. I wanted to highlight a couple papers that came out this week. Um, I don't know if, how active you've been in reading recently, but there have been a couple things that I've run across. Uh, the first one is, I think this is an older article. I don't know when this was published. Well, this is pretty new. I think this is published this week. This is in uh, PLOS, I think it's PLOS Biology or PLOS One, one of the PLOSes. Anyways, this is a core concepts document on how synaptic printing shapes neural wearing during development and possibly in disease. And so this is a primer that has come out recently on uh, neural pruning or synaptic pruning, which is an important part of the critical period. So if you're interested in the critical period, this is what goes on during the critical period. And so as the authors say here, um, or Jill Sakai is the author on this, at birth, an infant's brain is packed with roughly 100 billion neurons, some 15% more than it will have as an adult. As we learn and grow, our experiences strengthen the circuits that prove most relevant, while others weaken and fade. And so this is an interview with uh, Jeff Lichtman uh, from MIT or Harvard. And so this is, uh, over time, a large percentage of those wires are permanently disconnected. What you're left with is a narrower nervous system but it's tuned exactly to the world you found yourself in. Meaning that when you experience things, you get your brain is sort of shaped by that. And then that's what you come to experience maybe more deeply, but this has a, a, a neural basis. And so that's what a lot of this uh, mechanism that they describe in here is all about. And so, mm. um, and so we kind of talk about this in the, uh, developmental brain bird vehicles context where we have a body and then the brain itself is is developing in a certain way that you know adds or or loses connections the connections are selected upon and um, so that's I mean that's a uh, that's something I don't think people have really focused on too much in artificial intelligence uh, there's been some focus on it in the a life community but they really haven't gotten very far in that enterprise. So, you know, it's uh, it's definitely something that people have thought about, but they've not really implemented it very well. And certainly there's maybe a philosophy around it, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's popular to talk about, but I don't know. There's a lot of interesting work to be done as well. Um, so uh, they, this, article points out that synapses, the fixed points where one cell's ax axon exchanges signals with another cell, continue to be selectively removed, at least through adolescence, refining a coarse neural map into mature circuits. So the developmental process is quite uh, extensive, actually. We think about it as being like part of the baby's mind, but it actually goes well into uh, life, you know, even into what we consider to be adulthood. Um, so this is always, uh, and it's really, maybe it's unclear at this point even, you know, where, you know, like people talk about neural regeneration and there are some debates about neural regeneration and how extensive it is. Uh, that's actually part of development as well. I think we talked about like in the, uh, in the aging, uh, lecture that I gave this summer with, uh, Zuniti. Uh, we talked about mm -hmm. like how, you know, you can look you can look at certain tests for a visual or for spatial cognition, uh, and spatial cognition declines with age, and there's a lot of variation by age, and so why is that cognitive function declining? It's because those connections and those neurons are degenerating, and sometimes you can have regeneration. Sometimes the degeneration is is prolonged or it's it's it's. Uh, um, postponed through mm. aging. And so all those things have sort of analogs, at least with the developmental mechanisms. So developmental mechanisms build this brain that's, 
you know, it allows for regeneration, but it also allows for this selective pruning, the selective shaping. And so in aging, you have both this lack of regeneration, but also a lack of being able to remodel the brain. And so that's, uh, so that's all, it's all connected in that way. And so this, this article is pretty good, a pretty good way to kind of get a nice primer on this area. Uh, they get into a lot of uh, neurophysiology here. So, it, but it's accessible. So I think if you're interested in the neurophysiology, I think it's definitely something to read and to learn. See, they even have a section on late life pruning, which is what we're just talking about. So one hypothesis is that mechanisms are dysregulated by a challenge such as disease, injury, or aging. Aberrant activation of the developmental pruning mechanism could follow. So maybe, you know, and when you're, as you're aging, there's a dysregulation of this pruning mechanism and it prunes the wrong things instead of the right things, which we don't know really why it selects the right and wrong things. It could be some sort of heavy in learning. It could be something else. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a nice article to uh, cover if you're interested in that. That I just, okay, here it is. Actually, no, it's not there. Let me go back to the papers here. Um, okay. Why don't I share this drive on the chat so you can read some of these references. So that should be shared. And if you need permissions, let me know. Uh, one of the other uh, articles, this is an Aon article. So this is a popular, another popular press article. And uh, this is something that I ran across this week. Michael Levin and Dan Dennett were both at Tufts. And we know Dan Dennett from Philosophy of Mind uh, and, and assorted things. Michael Levin is a biologist who does a lot of stuff with regeneration. So this is uh, cognition all the way down. So they're arguing here that, and we talked about non neuronal cognition. We're talking about that in one of the presentations for Neuromatch. But this is, they're sort of laying out the argument for this idea here. So biology's next great horizon is understand cells, tissues, and organisms as agents with agendas, even if unthinking ones. And so they lay out an argument here for cognition or, you know, sort of cognition, not necessarily mind, but cognition being the, you know, the thing that guides agency. And so you have your agents, which are your cells or your tissues or your organisms. And then they have cognition or a form of cognition, which is this ability to conduct agency and things like that. So they kind of go through this. Uh, is, that, is that like getting a cellular automata kind of stuff? Or? Uh, I don't think they mention cellular automata explicitly, but they do talk about like, um, they talk about things that happen, like so cells will anticipate things. Uh, cells will know how to sort of connect to one another or organize with one another. And then the question's always been like, how does that happen? Is it just spontaneous or is it like something that is, um, you know, guided or, you know, uh, we don't really know, but their argument is that, you know, you can think about it in terms of a cognitive mechanism of some type, information processing, essentially, but also mm -hmm. that that's sort of thought about as a cognitive mechanism. So they don't, I don't think they talk about cellular automata, but the, you know, we can see like with agent-based modeling, there's a connection there to computational methods. So, um, so there's this older idea of teleology. I don't know if we've talked about that, but this is the idea that there's a sort of preordained flow of time so like you know things work towards a goal so like you know if you think about um something like history one might argue a teleological view of history might be that history is working towards some goal right like uh marx i guess was a teleologist uh in terms of thinking about this arc of history or you know there are other people who in uh some earlier religious views of uh, 
evolution would imply teleology, that life was evolving towards a goal or changing towards a goal. And of course that's wrong because we know that natural selection is, uh, you know, doesn't really have a goal. It's just kind of, you know, it's uh, to be, you know, to adapt to its surroundings. So you have this thing that looks like teleology, but it isn't teleology. Uh, so, you know, that's something that's been discredited, but you do have this, still have this question of how do you get things, how do like cells form like a collective shape or form a collective, uh, a multicellular collective that, you know, can deal with things adaptively. And so then, you know, you have to think about information processing and things like that. So, hmm. uh, when cognitive science turned its back on behaviorism more than 50 years ago, it began dealing with signals and internal maps, goals and expectations, beliefs and desires. Biologists were torn. They conceded, all right, people and some animals have minds. Their brains are physical minds, not mysterious dualistic minds, processing information and guiding purposeful behavior. Animals without brains, such as sea squirts, don't have minds, nor do plants and fungi or microbes. Um, so this is the sort of dilemma you have. You know, some organisms have minds and you can say, okay, the mind can do things. And in other organisms, they clearly don't have minds and they're doing similar things. And so how does that work? Um, so, we, you know, we want to avoid these sort of metaphors where we say, you know, genes are selfish, but they're not really selfish. We use the word selfish gene to describe sort of how, you know, genes work relative to other, you know, biological mechanisms. Antibodies aren't really seeking, although we talk about that them that way. Uh, cells weren't really figuring out what they were or where they were. So there are mechanisms for like spatial, you know, spatial gradients and identity that aren't really like what they are in humans, but, you know, they operate in their own way, but you have to describe them some way. So you have these sort of descriptive things that are our language limits kind of how we can see these things um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the genes and, and cells and antibodies don't have agendas it's just that we don't you know maybe they're not exactly like the way humans do this and so they go on through this um, i mean it you know it's a nice essay there's been some pushback yeah. on twitter about it but um, you know, it's, it's really kind of a nice essay, I think, I mean, if you don't agree with it. So, yeah, definitely read it if you can. Um, and then there's this last paper I'll talk about, which is, came out, I think, this week uh, in Trends in Cognitive Science, Artificial Intelligence and the Common Sense of Animals. And so this is... Uh, paper, I guess it's, you know, meant to be like a crossover between AI and sort of animal behavior. Um, so I don't know any of these, I've not heard of any of these authors before. So, um, so the problem of common sense remains a major obstacle to progress in artificial intelligence. Here we argue that common sense in humans is found on a set of basic capacities that are possessed by many other animals capacities pertaining to the understanding of objects, space, and causality. The field of animal cognition has developed numerous experimental protocols for studying these capacities. And thanks to progress in deep reinforcement learning, it is now possible to apply these methods directly to evaluate reinforcement learning agents in 3D environments. Besides evaluation, the animal cognition literature offers a rich source of behavioral data which can serve as the inspiration for RL tasks and curricula. So this is kind of what we've been like with the uh, the feedback pro feedback loops project. It's sort of what kind of what we're talking about. We have a source of behavioral data, and then we have a computational model, and it's not an RL model. But I think the idea is, is that you know RL is maybe developed enough so that we can draw, for, you know, parallels between the two. Um, it's actually a nice paper for the, uh, the uh, 
biological neural networks, artificial neural networks submission that Krishna and I have. I was going to send them some papers. There are a bunch of papers like this where they've made this parallel between like real brains and artificial brains and real behavior, artificial behavior and so forth. So this this is some another one of those papers. Um, one nice thing about the trends art, uh, journals is that they have these highlight sections. So they kind of talk about the highlights of the paper here. So the highlights are uh, endowing computers with common sense remains one of the biggest challenges in the field of AI. Most treatments of the topic foreground language. <clears throat> so they talk about language here. Yet an understanding of everyday concepts such as objecthood, containers, obstructions, paths, etc., is arguably one a prerequisite for language and two evident to some degree in non-human animals. So they have basically what they're saying is animals of concept learning, but not necessarily non-human animals, concept learning, but not necessarily language, or at least not language that we have. Um, so that language circuit isn't working in the same way. Uh, birds might be an exception to that, but uh, they still have concepts. Uh, then the recent advent of deep reinforcement learning in 3D simulated environments allows AI researchers to train and test in a virtual sense embodied agents and conditions analogous to the life of an animal. Which may or may not be true. I don't know. Um, I think reinforcement learning may not, or at least the way we think of like neural nets may not be the way to think about that. I talked a couple weeks ago about something called animats mm -hmm. and um that's maybe closer to what they're kind of getting at here i haven't i haven't had time to give the animats lecture but i will at some point soon because it's very interesting uh even historically it's very interesting to see what they were doing like say 20 years ago and uh you know it, they ha they don't have the sophistication of like deep learning networks but they're definitely uh, they definitely did a lot of, they exhibited a lot of behaviors, you know, that were, um, I don't think Brainberg vehicles qualify as animats, but uh, we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. Um, with the right architecture, an RL agent inhabiting a simulated 3D world has the potential to acquire a repertoire of fundamental common sense concepts and principles given suitable environments, tasks, and curricula. So they're arguing that you can actually build like common sense concepts into a RL architecture. Um, experimental protocols from the field of animal cognition can be repurposed for evaluating the extent to which an agent after training understands a common sense concept or principle, in particular in a transfer setting. So they have this thing called transfer learning, which is if I teach you something about say, uh, flying a virtual plane, uh, you can get into a real cockpit and fly a real plane. Or if you learn something about like how a gas pedal works on a car, you can learn how a gas pedal works on like a video game of a car, a race car. And so those are, you know, you, that's a very simple uh, example of transfer learning. But basically it's training uh, someone or an organism in one domain and then being able to go to another domain where things are similar and applying those skills to that environment. Um, let's see. So they talk about language. They talk about deep RL. Um, and then because deep RL or deep learning is becoming more sophisticated, we can start to talk about this. Um, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Uh, and, they talk about, uh, so students of animal cognition can take for granted a number of background assumptions that do not necessarily apply to an AI system. These include facts that are so obvious that they go unnoticed. Uh, and they talk about the embodiment of an animal and its situatedness in a 3D spatial environment. Um, an equally obvious assumption is that animal researchers can safely make is that their subjects are motivated by various basic needs and will therefore exhibit purposeful behavior rather than say simply doing nothing. 
None of these things is inherently true of an AI system. A disembodied digital assistant such as Siri or Alexa cannot be placed in a maze or presented with a box of containing food. In the context of a robot, an embodied system that interacts with the real world, um, this makes sense, but most robots are programmed to carry out predefined tasks in highly constrained circumstances. And to present one with a novel situation is more likely to result in an inaction or a catastrophe. So they don't know how to deal with uh, unfamiliar things. Mm -hmm. So if I, I tell Siri to, well, I mean, you can imagine like a, a personal assistant, uh, if you give it some command that's unfamiliar, um, I can't think of one right now. Uh, but you you could you can think of a very silly thing that you know humans might say a human expression that isn't even really within the vocabulary of the agent and they won't understand what it is. Like um, you yes, know, I've, I've, I've said several strange things to the or the system, and I'm like, sorry, I don't understand that. Yeah, and so that's I mean that's what they're getting at here, and I think it's it's really worth kind of at this point just kind of thinking about this as. You know, there is like this deep sort of embodiment element to this, uh, but there's also the idea of, you know, uh, your, what your model, you know, how it's sort of situated in the world. So um, there's a lot to think about with this, I think. Um, let's see. Are people relating the idea of, uh, Alex, the, Alex Stasis to this, just like, I'm just thinking like, when I think of like major challenges in, in, in uh, I guess, human robot interaction, I'm thinking a lot about like, robots don't understand the, what environmentally regulates people, like even like, like hot and cold, well, I mean, I feel like this isn't a weird example that's kind of easy to simulate, but certain ranges are at least exactly suitable for people, or other ranges will injure or make make a person uncomfortable. Is 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 there like language used for like I don't? A kind of like Alex that at common sense. I guess there would probably be a lot of this in like human and robot interaction. I'm not really familiar with literature. Yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know how they've dealt with it. I'm not that familiar with the but literature either, but. It, it reminds me of like, like one, like there's a very, <clears throat> it, it's interesting because that would require certain amounts of either especially trained rope, like in current levels of AI with mon not much generalization, it require a very specific amount of training for that. That's a, that's kind of adjacent to one of my first research products in effective computing, which was how do we get even like a pre a precursor to that was like how do we get an AI system, a robot, even in basic visual non verbal sense, to be able to quantify or or process like human social interaction. It's like even being able to understand oh, there's two people two humans here and they have a relationship. So even like the fundamental levels of how people are interacting around each other, like that's that's like, and even like that's a, like a, a, a preceding problem that's definitely being worked on and definitely there's a lot of questions and some answers and solutions and very interdisciplinary, very focused on and trying to find ways to, to, to apply very traditional concepts or, or classical concepts in, in, in you know categorizing emotion and, and things like that. So if there's a lot yeah. there's a lot to be done there. Yeah, I, I can say for a fact I've not run across too much analostasis in this literature. Mm -hmm. So that might be something to focus on like uh, to to really kind of explore uh, you know, there is there a model of some sort of allostatic regulation going on? Because right now they're I think they're thinking more in terms of like transfer learning and like things like, so, you know, you're learning concepts and you're able to transfer, say, like um, a concept of opening a jar to maybe anything that would screw, you know, like this. 
So it would be like uh, yeah. opening a lid or maybe like opening a door using a handle. So you could use the same thing and you could apply it to a different domain. And but but it's about figuring things out. It's not just about applying it blindly. So you know, to open a door, you'd have to move your hand like this, and then turn, and then it push. And so instead of pulling, and you have to figure that out. But it's you know, it's intuitive for us, but that intuition isn't going to be there for a robot. And and that would be like sort of the idea of transfer learning, where you're making like you're taking one yeah. thing from one domain, putting it in another, and then putting things together and saying, oh, that's what that's how you do this. And I, I think I think one of the biggest like mountains, like like if one of my takeaways from the Stanford conference on triangulate, triangulating intelligence, neuroscience, psychology, AI, whatever, and like the generalizability problem, like like there were a couple of talks that specifically mentioned common sense, like like the paper we looked at, and another generalizability problem that like all these are like a mountain, and it's like uh, there's there's all these different path towards it and like like definitely allostatic regulation that you're talking about is like totally there and but and like the, i think that's like a a higher level uh version of that and like people like like rather than saying people like we're still working on a generalization for like how how to how for a robot with a camera to realize oh well like this is a cop and this is a cop too and i can do the same things with them and, and you know like but they look slightly different. Are you sure you can use them? Like, like we're still very much in very weak, very weak and brittle, like generalizability in many different across many different fronts is like this, 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 this big question. Mystery. I yeah, I guess why I mentioned it is because for my artificial intelligence class, what there is the project that you, you have a semester long project and I was thinking I wanted to make like a toy model of allostatic a toy model of allostasis that is amenable to different dimensions and roles within a niche so I'm definitely always going to be more gifts and stuff but I think yeah. that the idea of um what is it called uh common sense though i don't think it's directly related to what i'm the toy model because the toy model is inherently kind of removed from common sense but i think i was interested if anyone done work on that kind of like incorporation of regulation and uh, uh differentiation of regulatory strategies and relaying that and relating that to how we organize to our environment but yeah i think that would definitely be something that like that probably a little bit outside the breadth of the toy model it's a nice yeah. long toy model i i feel like you'll probably will definitely find like what i i i'm sure there's things like that in like straight up like selfish psychology or or like like there are people who definitely study that it's just are they computationally driven a lot of time i don't know but like there are there is agent-based models there are ways to combine the two which is like this is exactly the dilemma that i had with my effective computing thing that i mentioned as like my first research project like well yeah look at the literature and like social like this psychology or, or social psychology or social science or whatever kind of thing and then how do we move that towards a, a model in this way uh, so like I, I think I'm sure you can find something that that you know me yeah. me merges those two things or, or like I think the deadline for like what was that? so I think I definitely will like probably this week round up some literature that will yeah. at least be that like, for the presentation hi I would, I would like it's a puppy I would totally encourage you to discuss that in the lab a little bit, like, you know, like yeah. talk about it because I'm I want to know about it myself. Yeah, yeah if it's if it's not due by next week, I I might like do a quick. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll definitely update about that. If it's not, I don't, I don't think it's due for next week. I think she didn't mention it, but like I remember, it was sometime shortly after midterms. But I don't think it's this week. It might be next week. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, 
Okay. Yeah, let me. Uh, yeah, that's a good. Uh, yeah, it, like I said, I don't. I don't think there's anything like an AI that people are doing. Maybe in psychology, uh, but but again, it's comp is it computationally motivated? Probably not. Yeah. I wonder how much like. Okay, so it's a little above me computationally now, but I wonder how much risk and stuff is like amenable to models of. Like, I, I generally understand the principles behind predictive processing and the idea that, like, you're minimizing chaos. But how much, how much does that conceptually translate into the idea of, like, you're regulating an internal state? Because I feel like there's a lot of similar dynamics to how I've heard for this stuff described, though I don't understand it mathematically yet. And I wonder if you have any view on that. Okay. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if they've, uh, done much with, uh, internal state. I mean, I know they've been applying it to everything, but, uh, I don't really know. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't really know the mathematics too well of what, like, the free energy principle one, on that, but. It, it one, kicked my ass, but it would have kicked my ass, but I kind of wish I signed up for the predictive processing course in my, at my school rather than formal logic last semester. But I have friends who took it, so I'm asking them about it. <laughs> yeah. There's also that. Oh, I don't know if I said, I don't know if I mentioned it here in or in orthogonal lab, but there's a predictive processing conference that we found out with the group. I don't know if I posted that in here, but I I think it's like free-ish or like no, it was just like email the organizers. So I'll, I'll try to. I'll make it up to, to mention that. I might actually ask my friends for the predictive processing syllabus, because that seems like a good resource. Yeah. Also, like, um, just to kind of mind what you said, like, Joshua Tenenbaum, who I often mention here, and he's, he's like at MIT, and he's an actual computational cognitive scientist. And he's done a lot of some of his work recently has been about, it's not niche based necessarily, but, but what, but it, it, it could go very adjacent to a, like how um, multi-agent, what, 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 what's hot related to what you're saying, like multi-agent learning, multi-agent interactions. Um, and and he, he, like that, that came up a lot at Stanford the conference and also at the Bridging A and Cognitive Science Workshop and the DeepMind people and so on. So multi-agent, settings and multi-agent learning, like that would definitely be applicable for, for this niche sort of thing. And Josh, some of Josh Tenenbaum's work, and I think Rose Wang, one of his students, Rose, I think it's Rose, uh, they're looking at how different agents in like a, optimal ways for different agents in like a, like, like, a, like in a, a kitchen setting to, 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 to do different tasks and organize task structure. So I mean, there's there's different work in that sense, and that is like computational cognitive science um, and multi-agent learning. Like there there's definitely stuff there it, um, that that that's happening. So, right. Well, can you see that again? Computational what in multi-agent settings? Computational cognitive science, oh. or just like Joshua Tenenbaum. Yeah. Well, I think you can see through some papers. So. I think like. The issue sometimes is like the issue of too many rabbit holes. I think at this point, what we're going to do is probably just ask people if they have any, ask people if they have any hot buzz words, grab a few art, grab a few, grab a few papers from each, find a few authors, read a few app, read abstracts from each, the, the organizer look at Google Doc and ask about each, ask about what people who are more knowledgeable impressions of each are. And then from that, commit to a few of the papers that seem most relevant and dig in. Yeah. And then like, you know, like the, what you eventually develop and kind of what I'm doing a lot of my frontier map and, and, and things like that is like, you start really thinking, okay, here's a gigantic mountain, like the mountain of generalizability. And like you're, you have a particular trajectory up to it. That's very adjacent to that problem with like, Oh, well, I want to study Austin regulation. Okay. Here's on this thing. And you go to another, you know, question of like, okay, multi-agent learning, how do we do that? You know, there's another mountain and another trajectory and you start getting these, you start, you start getting the landscape or the topology of the different problems 
and is just this conceptual abstraction mountain. Yeah, that's true. I keep I keep using mountains as reference points in my sessions, but yeah. We should, um, we should go climb a mountain. Well, that's, I'm sure we are as we are here. Anyway, um, I don't know if you wanted to, if you were done talking about your paper, the paper stuff that you had, Bradley. So. Oh, well, let me just finish up with this one. But that's a good good conversation because I think yeah. it's definitely putting this in a good context. So. And then maybe we'll follow up on some predictive processing stuff, or we'll try to. I'll try to find some things on it to see. Um, but then, yeah, so let me finish up on this paper. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, it okay, so they get into the three D environments for deep reinforcement learning agents. So this is what they're using: DeepMind's Playroom environment, which is really kind of cool. I, I, I've seen this before, and I'd like to try it, but. Uh, screenshot from the animal AI environment. So this is actually what they've done with like uh, animats in the past, where they put them in these in the, uh, put them in these virtual environments and they train them on objects. So like these objects are virtual, but they ha they can be specified properties, uh, and then the AI has to sort of figure out you know how to move things, how to put the teddy bear on the blo blue block, has to figure out the color of the block. And then the shape of the teddy bear as opposed to like a bottle. And then, you know, so it has to make a couple of judgments and it has to have common sense. So it has to know like what on top of is. Uh, so that's, but this is extracted from natural language. So again, it's language based, but, you know, uh, but that's what it would encounter in the real world an instruction in language and then it has to do something in a spatial 3D environment. So then, of course, the agent receives an reward for consuming uh, things and, and doing the right thing. And then, so this is, uh, let's see, uh, they talk about even the most powerful contemporary language models trained purely in text, such as Open OpenAI's GPT-3, struggle with common sense uh, inferences that a human would find straightforward. So as much as they've hyped uh, GPT-3, you know, it still can't do these sorts of things. Um, the lack of grounding for systems trained on text alone is an insuperable barrier to the ever fully matching humans in this respect. And then they get into objects and their affordances. There actually is a, a part on this on Gibsonian psychology. They talk about, I don't think they do anything cool with it other than mention it. Um, just that the Gibsonian uh, perception is, is a radical view compared to some of the other views of uh, perception that exist. So, you know, this is interesting because people talk about Gibsonian uh, perception, Gibsonian uh, psychology and affordances and all that, but they never really define it in, in quantitative terms. So that might be something that is an open area that we can take advantage of. Uh, they really, you know, uh, it, I guess, you know, it gets sort of quantified in this, in the, uh, sense of like a, if a machine learning model or a deep learning model operates on something or a robot, it becomes quantitative in terms of the representation, you know, but we don't have, like, we don't know what, you know, how to actually quantify the sort of Gibsonian information. If, you know, you see things moving in the world and, and it's relevant to cognition because not everything that moves is relevant to cognition and maybe it enables it and affordance enables cognition, but it doesn't mean that that's, you know, that it describes, fully describes it. So there's a lot of work to be done in this area. Um, and so this is a very long paper, so I'm not going to go through a lot of it, but this, these are some of the experimental protocols from animal cognition that they're using. So they're doing uh, this trap tube method, which is, um, the stick is pulled out from a, from the wrong end of this trap tube, the food item is lost. So you have to be able to, uh, maintain the food item, figure out how this trap works. Uh, that's one task that you can do. Uh, there's object permanence. So there's baiting and transformation. So it's kind of like putting a ball in a cup and then moving the cups around to different locations and then trying, you know, ha having the 
AI or animal track this, uh, you know, track where the ball is. So they can, you know, it kind of, they see the ball go into the cup, the cup gets moved around different positions and then they have to predict where the cup is. That's, I, I know this from experience that dogs may or may not do well on this. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that is equivalent across animal species or, you know, different animals or whatever, but it's a task you can use to, to sort of get a sense of how the animals or how the machine is thinking, how the model can sort of reason from common sense. If I put a ball in, in the cup and I move the cup to this position, then I should look there and find the ball. Okay, so that's good. I mean, those are things we can do. Um, and then it leads into things like object permanence and containers and enclosures. So the concept of an enclosure or a container is important for both of those tasks because you have to have a mo mental model where you have, you break things down into containers and then you track the containers and figure out, you know, reason from that. So, it's a long paper. Um, then they talk about common sense physics. So the, you know, there's a sort of a common sense physics, like how gravity works. So if you see, I mean, you don't have to know the mathematics of gravity to know that it works you experience it and you have a, a sense of things falling or, you know, uh, inertia, things like that. So those are all things that are sort of, you can predict, use those to predict things in the world, or you can make predictions about the world using gravity as a, as a guide. You don't have to know the, the mathematical representation of it to know that it works. It help, it's helpful if you know the mathematical representation Let's say if you had the mathematical representation, but you didn't know that, you know, objects, say if you programmed a bunch of objects to have, you know, to, or you programmed an agent to say, okay, here are the mathematics of gravity and here are the objects that have gravity applied to them. But if you introduced a, an object that didn't have an application of a gravity function, then would that still behave according to the laws of gravity? Your agent wouldn't know necessarily if that were the case. But if you can reason from common sense, even without the fancy representation, you know basically that that's going to happen, that that's, any object is going to be subject to gravity. And so that's, that's what that's about. Uh, so they talk about, so common sense can be thought of as a set of interrelated fundamental principles and abstract concepts. Ideally, we would like to build AI technology that can grasp these interrelated principles and concepts as a systematic whole and manifest this grasp in a human level ability to generalize and innovate. How to build this technology is open. We don't know how to do it. But we advocate an RL approach using RL agents, uh, maybe with as of yet undeveloped architectures, uh, which acquire what is needed through interactions in rich virtual environments. With the right architectures, environments, tasks, and curricula in place, we might be able to tackle language uh, using analogy and metaphor from language. Then we can get to these foundational concepts of common sense and apply them at a higher level of abstraction. That's a nice paper. Um, again, yeah, but I really like what, how they, 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 they summarize like environment with the right environment architecture whatever in place like i think that's a really good way to, to kind of reference that um yeah yeah definitely I, I think the comparison of dogs continues to be interesting here just to think of like it's almost like like when a, when you're training a dog to um i don't know sniff for bombs they don't know what a bomb is or why people want to find them but they, yeah. they, they have a reward and they have a uh, visual, visual and um, wait, uh, odor, this is a word, I forgot, smell-based um, affordances to allow them, to, olfactory affordances to be able to, Not to be same. able to be trained to do that if they have a toy environment with a reward for, for that for engaging those affordances. And I think that's an interesting way to think about this level of training AI. You are yeah. kind of like training 
in the training of horses in the way we do with dogs or cats or other service animals. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and like definitely, you know, we, we might think of like um, this, yeah, we might think of like training for common sense as like a human level ability, but really maybe it's just about like the reward and the, and just being able to find things and there's some common sense, but it's not like you don't have to have a really high level representation to get there. I wonder how much Alice Daisy can require for a high level representation. Like when I think of anything that is a high level representation, it involves really complex um, concept understandings of Alice Daisy across different scales, like about like liberty um, i'm simultaneously applying the idea of personal autonomy which in a way is a kind of abstract strategy to multiple different scales and identifying that as a teleological worthy goal and i think it'd be interesting to relate i guess Alex Alex Basis in Ecclesiology as uh, needed for higher presentation. Yeah. Yeah, that's something to think about. Uh, I mean, then, you know, is allostasis so, you know, maybe allostasis is more like sort of natural selection where it doesn't really require uh, a model like the organism doesn't necessarily have to have a model of natural selection, but it knows like that there's something that's positive, you know, there's like positive reinforcement, but it's, you know, more subtle than that. Um, but the, the, the agent doesn't necessarily have to have a model of natural selection to be, you know, to be subject to natural selection, I guess. So, I mean, I don't know, like, I don't know what allostasis, if you need a whole model of allostasis or if you just need like, uh, to be subject to it and to kind of interact with it in a way that's like you basically yeah. know what you need and you don't you know you know what you maybe to what to avoid and it just kind of comes from this, that. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was saying this this is presents an interesting relationship between affordances and allostasis for me because it's like I, I kind of feel like allostasis is sometimes is like like a, a basin like like it's oh, okay i'm in i'm in this zone and this is this is stable and they go oh, i'm out okay am i in another am i in another zone or not and then you know and kind of the the, the the i wouldn't say calcul i don't know if i could say calculations about that but more like allostasis you know i i i kind of i give i give what brother said about it in the sense of like uh you know it's you don't need a, a model of natural selection to be subject to it or operate by its laws. And in the same way, it's sort of like uh, the the regulation itself is there, but it's also sort of there's there's this sort of uh, very complex. There's a complexity about it, it in some ways, and there's some elements of uh, there's there's an interesting sort of embodiment like. Physically speak, like in a physical, non-neuronal, if you will, process of regulation, there are these sort of zones that things you know, stabilize in homeostatic ways, and then and kind of, you know, uh, like the, there's a basin where like you, you're in this, you're. I know there's a better technical term for it than that, but there's there's a zone where like you you have stability and you kind of you know orbit around it basically, right, and but at the same time, like when you get to higher levels of allostatic alis, regulation, especially like a little cognitive stuff and higher representation, and, and especially especially all this stuff that Anson's kind of getting at is like very social. Like, we, well, some of the applications are are in social things, but not necessarily. Um, when you get up to that level, like it's still sort of affordance based, and, and affordance either, you know, it could be chicken or the egg or which, which part of the feedback loop is, is, is the driver, you know, we'll, we'll, whatever complexity take on that you want to have, but there's a shaping of 
what I would, I, I think I, I don't want, I don't want to say too much because I know there's very particular ways to talk about affordances and like, oh, affordances provide the opportunity to do X, Y, Z. But it's sort of like there's a perception that also influences how you can conceive of those affordances as well. So I think, I think I'll leave it at that for now. And we can talk about this after the meeting. Kind of, yeah. It's late, so yeah. All right. So yeah, um, that was the paper. I just wanted to talk about one thing before we go, and that's uh, I just made up a project board for the conference submissions. So oh yeah, um, yeah, I think that's a good thing. We'll go maybe next week. We'll update like some of these, uh, and then this includes the submissions to NeurIPS we'll, when we get you know accepted or rejected we'll put those on the board as well and just kind of follow those through uh, i don't know how much we'll use it but i just wanted to make it there and also uh i talked about a bit about that blog post for the um for the uh feedback loops yeah. project oh. maybe something during neuromatch um, that's still open i've been thinking about it more uh but you know once we get done with the uh, talks maybe during that week we can revisit just writing like a some sort of blog post um and it doesn't have to be directly on the project it can just be kind of like about neuromatch and then bring the project in as a an aside I'll, I'll maybe i'll try to work up a draft uh we can review it um on slack and just kind of get some feedback and maybe put it up during that week so that it kind of ties into what's going on uh, definitely though i think it's going to be a good week uh, it's going to be a busy week but probably like you know we'll be able to get some uh, interest in some of the work that we're doing and just kind of like putting the talks on social media and making sure that people are aware that it's being put on at neuromatch and so forth mm. yeah that's good and i still i'm still writing my other articles and i'm still uh, even even just to kind of mention this um I had some more ideas that I'll talk about um, in Slack about some lab manager professional development stuff to help other lab members uh, with things. And I think I will continue. Um, it's not an immediate thing, but, but just to get it set up, the, the cognition futures, like whatever that research subgroup thing that I was talking about, future of cognition, I don't really know. Like that's still, just to mention that as, as in, in the field of play and stuff that will be flushed out in time. Okay. But that's probably it for me. I have to go to go soon too. So. All right. Anything you want to mention, Anson, before we go? Um, no, I have many, many different leads, which is exciting. I think the biggest thing for me is prioritizing which leads to follow, getting general, switching between getting general overview and digging in. And I think. It's a, it's a very fascinating time in the field where there's a lot of big questions for, that people have leaded into and different, there's different, there's been accumulations of different, um, vastly different approaches that all have, that all, that all kind of failed, but all, or have been inadequate, but have their own unique strengths. I think, I wish there was more focus. I know some people are doing it. But I wish there was more of a focus on integration rather than, um, uh, I guess, cr cr crystallization. I feel like people have been doing this for centuries. Well, not exactly this, but, uh, but I guess like, well, I, I think a lot, I think like there's different kinds of sciences and like there, there, there used to be different kinds of approaches. Some people naturally are more implementation or refined crystallization oriented. I find that more boring, but I think it's, it's, it's necessary work. And I think it's interesting, yeah, it's interesting time. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, it actually took me a while to understand, and I don't have a, the best background probably, but it, it took, there was a sort of, and this, is, this is actually a driver to my frontier map and, and it's all of, all of this for, I don't know all of its offspring is is 
there's a certain level of understanding you have to have to realize, oh, wow, there's a huge amount of really important open questions that are happening now and that people haven't been able to even look at or try to model at all in any way until recently. And I think a lot of things fall in this and a lot of integrated models and like what happened to cognitive science, like like where, what are people even trying to do with, with studying cognition broadly? So yes, I, I agree with that. Probably a good note to end on. Well, thanks for attending the meeting. Uh, if you're watching online, uh, a lot of things to follow up on. So we'll be in Slack talking about those. Um, and then we'll be getting ready for Neuromatch. I uh, hope to see everyone next week with uh, their, if they want to review their slides, you're welcome to bring your slides, whatever state they're in, and we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone. See you later. Yeah. Okay. Next week. See you next week.